Hello and welcome to our series of business interviews. Today the interview is going to be conducted by Jonathan Slobum, who is a long-time associate of To The Point Marketing. So today we're on home territory. We're actually in Windsor. So our office is in Windsor and we're speaking to a local businessman and entrepreneur, Andrew Try. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much. So, Andrew, in a moment I'm going to let you explain all about your business, but suffice to say, you are a serial entrepreneur. Um, you've got a fantastic journey to share with our listeners today. And most latterly, you are the MD and founder of Comexo. That's right. So let's start right at the beginning. Take me right the way back to um, what happened and got you involved in the world of being an entrepreneur. Uh, well, Jonathan, it's a, it's a long story over the last 25 years, but... Uh, I was one of the kids at school who didn't repay my parents back for the private education they gave me. Uh, I gave them a D, E and an F at (laughs) A-level. And that being the case, uh, university within the UK was not uh, uh, possible. Uh, They came up with an idea to send me over to the States where entry into the university system uh, in America was done through the SATs. That it was a multiple choice question with four answers and a dot to colour in, which I could do. And uh, I did get into Northeastern University uh, where I studied, uh, I started studying entrepreneurship. Uh, I reckon I'm probably the only person in the UK of my age with a degree in entrepreneurship. You're certainly the only one I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's always that thing can entrepreneurship be taught? Well, There is a toolkit that can be taught that when you put it together with a bit of enthusiasm um, can can produce entrepreneurs. Yeah. So um, what did you learn at university that actually um, inspired you to go on to actually be an entrepreneur rather than just be a student of entrepreneurship? Well, uh, I always wanted to be uh, an entrepreneur. I come from a family of entrepreneurs uh, in Windsor, uh, Windsorian coaches, uh, which... Uh, you still see today and holds the royal warrant for shipping people around in the back of a coach was started by my grandfather in 1918 uh, when he was just 18 years old uh, just after the first world war my father was uh, an entrepreneur and that I knew with my exam results was probably the only thing that I was going to be able to do start my own business Uh, so that was the uh, the impetus it's a family thing Um, after coming back from the states I had uh, an American attitude to starting businesses um, that I thought would give me a great advantage back in the UK. And uh, that that is the advantage of just getting on and getting things done. It's part of the American dream. Part of the American dream. Stop talking about it and start doing it. Uh, So when I came back from the States, uh, my father uh, ran a serviced office um, just on exit five of the M4, mm-hmm. uh, where he rented office space on short-term lets to uh, any type or size of organisation. And I worked there for a couple of weeks, and it dawned on me that there were quite a lot of people that were coming in and asking uh, for offices, finding out that they were too expensive to rent, and then asking if we could just provide them with a an address and a telephone answered under their company name so that they could pretend they were actually a uh, fully fledged business when they weren't the start of virtual businesses and thus we started a small telephone answering business with a single telephone where when the uh, the line rang we just had to answer good morning good afternoon may I help you and pretend to be the company uh, that uh, the 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 people were asking then of course technology changed Uh, the phone systems grew bigger the ability to be able to provide DDIs that were answered in individual company names set us on a track of being a uh, what is now considered telephone answering business and that actually pushed us into uh, some fairly large call centre type uh, type work. So let's just explore that in a bit more detail. We all know once you're getting a business off the ground the idea is the easy bit. Getting customers and those first customers is the hardest task of what did you do to get those customers? Well, in those days, before the internet, I uh, used the Yellow Pages. And uh, we advertised uh, a lot in the Yellow Pages. We also did a lot of local work um, around the local uh, chambers of commerce, entrepreneurs, yeah. clubs, biz, small business clubs, uh, to go and meet organisations, small businesses, start-up businesses that needed those types of services. And did you feel that was your sweet spot for... The type of customer or were you just broadly just going as 
anywhere you could possibly well, find. Well, as you're doing, you just go anywhere that you can possibly find. But we found that we grew quite rapidly into what, as I said, was call centre business that yeah. actually we're not in now, um, around the fact that we employed uh, Windsor-based ladies answering the phone with a particular accent. Yeah. So uh, we ended up doing... Uh, all the calls for Waitrose Flowers Direct, for instance, uh, because they wanted a middle class accent answering the phone. <laughs> uh, that's what they started wanting and were happy to pay the money for, but eventually that got uh, moved down to Cornwall and, and finally offshored uh, to Singapore, I think. Um, and that's when the, the call centre market started pushing everything offshore, and we realised that our value uh, um, proposition resonated with. Uh, more city-based firms that wanted a uh, first-class, five-star uh, first point of contact for their phones. And that shifted us out of the call centre market, uh, which was going down to the lowest common denominator, up into the switchboard market, which was a true brand pro- pro- you know, positioning for an organisation. Mm. Okay, right, we're going to come back to that point, because I, but what I'd like to explore a bit more is about your journey, mm-hmm. because I know it wasn't quite so simple as um, straight out of early call centres and into this upmarket um, proposition you've now got. Mm-hmm. What opportunities and projects did you um, come across on, on that journey? Jonathan, I did uh, everything. I started business after business. Um, I had a paintball war games company. Um, I got into uh, producing, manufacturing watches and stuffed toys out of China in the early 90s. Um, I had computer software companies. Um, I did lots of everything. And then as an entrepreneur uh, trying to make some money, I, I leapt at any opportunity that presented itself. I built some fairly large businesses, but could never focus long enough to build anything truly substantial. Okay. Uh, something I, I learnt to do uh, at a latter date. Okay, so what started to stimulate you to actually really start to focus your thinking and your resources around one opportunity? Um, apart from lots of people telling me to do so, <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it became clear that um, we had a very good value proposition in our marketplace. So all along the way, you're experimenting with these other opportunities, but you still had the contact centre running in the background. Yeah, the, the switchboard, uh, the little switchboard business almost enabled me to have other businesses okay. because whenever I started one, I could set up a telephone number and answer under that company name. Yes. Uh, so it gave me a huge amount of flexibility. Um, and that business kept on, just kept on running and kept on doing with no focus and no investment and no strategy. It just kept building and building. Mm. And all the other businesses uh, came and went. Um, some of them I, I, I made loads of money. Uh, some of them I lost lots of yeah. money. Uh, but underneath it all, at the end of the day, the switchboard business was still there and was still growing. And it was that realisation that if I actually focused all of my attention and my energies into uh, building that, I could probably have more fun, uh, more stability, um, and probably grow a more substantial business. Okay, so how long ago were we talking about when you started to hone your resources? Uh, About... uh, 13, 14 years ago okay. um, and that happened because uh, the uh, the internet age was, uh, was upon us, the dot com boom was just starting and one of our customers was an internet telephony company in fact the first company to enable you to create telephone calls, not over voice over the internet, but create telephone calls from an internet based web page and, yeah. and I saw it and got very enthusiastic and thought that if we bolted that capability and technology into our switchboard offering, we could provide a range of services for uh, larger scale corporates. Um, And that's when I uh, went out and raised uh, some money to put the two businesses together. Uh, And it was clear once outside investors had come in that my obligation to them was to focus solely on building that business. Okay. Okay, so... At this point, Waitrose has moved on, but you now 
getting a confidence that there is an opportunity for the premium services, where did you start to go and get those customers from? Where did you, how did you start to actually focus your thinking around a particular opportunity? What was, was, what was that opportunity? Well, um, in fact, once we had raised some money, we were, we were pushed by our investors to, to spend it as quickly as possible, which is what you did in 1999. Um, and we focused more on the technology we would bought in uh, and trying to sell that into an existing client base than we did on the value proposition. And once again, I would say that that took us on a, an unfocused journey um, around a technology set that was too ahead of its time in certain areas and not developed well enough in others to sustain the, uh, the, the requirements of the businesses that we had. That um, another four, three or four years went by before I actually saw that the uh, the focus around the technology and people putting that together was the real way forward. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it it wasn't obvious. Um, no. Uh, and again, that 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 sort of focus in the business of what the the value proposition today took an enormous amount of evolution to to come to. And I'm not talking about even our our uh, product or our our value proposition, but just in terms of the marketplace moving yes. on to appreciate it. Yes. Absolutely. So now you, you are clearly very focused. Um, what, what's the business actually doing today? Who are your target markets and how do you intend to grow out of this? So the business today is what I describe as 21st century switchboard and uh, business concierge services. Mm-hmm. And what we provide for specifically the uh, professional service sector and even more specifically the legal sector mm-hmm. is a 24-hour uh, provision of five star first point of contact switchboard services mm. that protect our customers' brands 24 hours a day, seven days a week, such that when a potential or existing customer wants to get hold of somebody within what is now complex, distributed, global workforces, they can do so through a single telephone number mm. at any time of day and get somebody knowledgeable capable, professional and charming Mm. to be able to take that call and then take it into the complex organisation and deliver it to the right person first time every time. And on the concierge services we provide a range of again 24 hour business concierge services that enable people within an organisation to to get stuff done. So rather than have to book their own taxi, set up their own voice conference call um, using Skype or something like that, mm. uh, find out who their travel management company is, uh, call their caterer because they forgot to order the sandwiches for Monday morning's meeting. Mm. They simply press a button on a smartphone app anywhere in the world. They'll come through to us. We will know who they are. We will know where they are. We'll have access to their page of details of what the normal services that they use, and we can get the stuff done for them. So I'm going to pick up on one word you said in there, which is global. So effectively, you have reversed the trend single-handedly of offshoring for contact centres because you've actually brought them or maintained them in the UK, but of course you're offering a premium service. We are. We are. And in fact, we never use the word contact centre or call centre in our business at all. Uh, <laughs> we use me. the word switch them not at all. Um, but but uh, actually, at this, at this very moment, we are hiring um, our first German and French speakers such that in the new year we will be rolling out to our existing client base um, French and German speaking switchboard provision for their French and German offices. So not only are we reshoring back to the UK, but we are starting to offshore from Europe and we are currently for one customer we are scoping Mandarin speakers. Wow. So we will bring it back from China to the UK. <laughs> so let's thinking about these people and the modern world, they're obviously going to be highly connected. They don't just carry one single device and, and it's no longer the luxury of one phone on a desk. How, how on earth do you track these people down to put a foot call through to them? So we build all of our own uh, communications and telephony technology in-house. And the reason that we do that is because we have to integrate it into the database and knowledge based systems that run these organizations um, so that we can even identify existing or previous customers by their telephone number that are coming into the organization it will enable our operators to see that this is an existing customer and who their normal partner is that they deal with before we even answer the phone so that 
we can anticipate their requirements and give them a feeling of familiarity in a five-star way, the way that if you were a regular uh, visitor to the Ritz in London, the doorman would know you, yes. know which suite you're usually in, um, and anticipate make sure that that uh, was the suite that you got. These sorts of five-star services differentiate the top 100 law firms in the City of London around the professional service that they give. And so we build that technology to enable us to do that. So are you a software house as well? Uh, we are a what I would call a software architecture house. Uh-huh. So we do all proof of concept, we do all architecture in-house, and then we send out the, uh, the code writing to Eastern Europe. So can that be purchased by others? No, nope. uh, it's specifically for our customers. We don't white label it. We don't sell it on to anybody else. And the reason, again, we do that is because we want to differentiate ourselves in our marketplace and just provide almost a boutique. We, 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 we talk these days, just recently, as a sort of atelier service for our client base, providing... Uh, technologies and services specifically for them. So it's as focused as you can It really is. It's music to our ears, absolutely. So look, Andrew, um, the impression we're giving the listeners is that it's just been this wonderful, smooth journey of a bit of experimentation, being a proper entrepreneur with lovely, steady growth into this fantastic business you've got today. We all know that's not the truth of the matter. What were the challenges that you faced on your journey? And more particularly, how did you overcome them? Well, yeah, Jonathan, you're right. Uh, your listeners can't see is that I am very grey and and <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that is because, of course, as an entrepreneur, I have uh, been out on the battlefield as a small business trying to uh, build organically rather than um, you know uh, build through equity or, or partnership or uh, joint venture. And it is that it is a hard route. Yeah. Um, I have stories as lists as long as your arm in terms of um, all the things that have got in the way. Uh, I remember one Christmas coming back after Christmas to find out that our telephone systems had been hacked and in four days £100,000 worth of call charges had been racked up. Um, On that particular one, we closed down the business, transferred all of our clients out, negotiated with the telephone company and presented them with an empty shell six months later for them to sue. Um, on another occasion, uh, when I was doing stuffed toys and watches out of China, I had employed a very bad bookkeeper who had got our VAT wrong, and I had a knock on the door from the VAT men who told me I'd defrauded them of £80,000. I was 26 years old, didn't think I had done, but they, uh, they, they took me through sort of a, a process that proved that I had um, and I almost got banged up in, in jail. Uh, <laughs> I'm just recently, in the last, in the last three months... Uh, we have lost suddenly through no fault of our own one of our largest customers uh, that was underpinning a, a, a large part of the profit of the business um, because of an edict from their US office that they needed to have a single supplier for uh, voice conference calling we provided super secure voice conference calling for them and so we've lost a large amount of business and what you do in all of these uh, cases is you simply roll up your sleeves you refocus you focus on the things that you are good at. You focus on the things that you make margin out of, mm-hmm. rather than things that, that, that drive revenue. Uh, so can you, I just put an interpretation on that, which I've heard in other um, podcasts we've done, that margin is absolutely critical, but more so than that, it drives the cash flow. Yeah. And there's a lot of successful, established businesses that have that huge Critical focus. success factor. Uh, collect your money. Don't let your partners, no matter what the size of them, uh, you know, not not pay you because cash flow at the end of the day drives your business, not revenue. Um, and if you've got cash flow, uh, you can actually run a business almost um, on a loss making uh, for, for for quite for quite a, a, a long period of time. Yes. But if you are making loads of revenue, and even if you're making profit and can't collect your cash then I'm afraid you will lose your business. Yes. Uh, so we, we have a policy here where uh, we don't allow any of our customers, no matter how large they are, uh, pay over 45 days. And if they do, we turn off their service. Um, and we're bloody minded about it. And we teach them from day one that that's what we're going to do. Yeah. 
even if they think they are the biggest company. If they value their, the service, they won't go anywhere else. They'll respect you and they'll pay you uh, for uh, all times uh, on, on, on time. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, I, mean, I can't emphasize that enough, how vitally important that is, um, because actually I've heard it said that a customer is not a customer unless they're actually paying you. And too many people show us um, huge sales pipelines and number of contracts fulfilled, but actually the money is not necessarily following the work. Yeah, uh, and the, the other thing that we like doing, well, we don't like doing here, but I always challenge my management team is that if the value of our service is as good as we say it is, yes. that we shouldn't be fearful of putting our prices up until our customers squeak. Yes. Um, and that's not to say to, uh, you know, because it's a small business, that's not to say to, to rip customers off, but tra- traditionally, or, or, you know, what, we, what, what small businesses tend to do is undervalue the service they give. They over-service their customers, they undercharge them, and then they get in a rut of a not putting up the prices every year when their cost base goes up yep. every year, and not being bold enough to actually really test the value of the service for their customers. You know, by by putting up um, their prices more than inflation, and that's partly that confidence is built out of the fact that you understand your customers' needs, you are actually meeting those needs better than the available competition, and therefore they actually can't go somewhere else easily and get a similar, um, ultimately a better service. Absolutely, and, and that, uh, that they appreciate the, the true value proposition and that you've sold them the right thing. So yes. in our marketplace, we, are, we have now focused on the top 100 because we do have a lag of customers that are from smaller law firms, but actually they don't buy us for the right reason, mm. they buy us because of price and ease, and they shouldn't really be customers. And so as our value proposition goes up the value chain and we're getting some of the large ones, we, we by putting our prices up, are letting some of those other ones yes. go. And we're pricing them out, which is, you know, our, so our product is finding its right place in the in, in It's a in bold the, in move the and takes confidence, but it's the right move as well. Not just because of a marketing purist point of view, which I think it's music to my ears, but also because of cash flow. Yeah, and, and, and investment. You know, we, we have, I tell our customers that we have a gross margin of 65% and a net margin of 20%. And we yeah. have to have that to be able to invest back into the organisation in terms of the uh, R&D that we are required to do to provide them with the services and technologies they're going to need in five years and it's as simple as that Great. Andrew, there's an awful lot more I could ask you um, but I'm going to ask you one broad question if you could distill all of this experience into one piece of advice to a founder of a, an established business who's now going through some of the stresses and strains of um, business growth when the market and the company both become more complex what would that be oh it's very difficult um because when you're up against it you're up against it as every entrepreneur will work will know it's all very well you saying that but doing it is a very different thing when you've got to pay the wages at the end of the month yeah um eventually what everybody realizes um and alan sugar so very uh succinctly says on the apprentice Just find one thing that sells and do more of it. Mm. Find the marketplace that values what you've got. Don't, so it's about focus. When you're up against it, of course, you have to evolve your business through that because there are moments when you just have to take what you can to pay the wages. But if you have strategically mapped out where you want to get to during a period of time, then you can start making the right choices through that evolution. Yes. And it becomes bit like a flywheel slow to start with but as momentum follows that will gain quicker and quicker momentum and you'll become more and more successful it's taken me 25 years to realize that real focus at the top end of the market with a a very well-defined value proposition is the secret Um, because it's taken me 25 years to to build that value proposition and the reputation in the marketplace to be able to get the larger customer yes that's what you need to do Great advice, great advice. So before I hand over to Dave, one quick question. It's all about you. Where does your energy come from? We all know that being an entrepreneur can be a lonely journey and something underneath, underlying in the personality of entrepreneurs keeps driving them on. What's yours? Well, I mentioned uh, beforehand I'm, a, I'm from a family of, of entrepreneurs. And that, uh, I have three sisters. All of them are entrepreneurs in their own way. Um, and we were brought up in, in, in that sort of environment. Um, 
I, I think I have, I mean, very loving parents, but, but parents that always wanted to ask, that's good, there's always better. So, so it's all, always about asking oneself, you know, what more can you do? Could you do it better? Um, there's also, I really get um, enthused by uh, new ideas or areas where uh, you can improve. And Richard yes. Branson's a great one of this. You don't need to in, invent a new industry. You can just take an existing one and do it 10 times better. There are yes. always areas that you can do things better. And, and when you look around the modern world, it's so clear mm. that there are massive areas that just need to be looked at in a different way and done better, that people are crying out for. Finding those, those, uh, those holes, those niches, that, that's what enthuses me. Um, you know, stepping forward, stop talking about it, start doing it. Mm. That's where I get my enthusiasm. Fantastic. Andrew, you are a fantastic guest. Um, at this point, I would normally give Dave one of two choices. And one of the choices normally is make a comment on the interview and what we've heard, which has just been great. Or offer a um, strategic marketing question to Andrew. I know Andrew's got a strategic marketing question he'd like to share with him, with us, but more importantly at this moment, Dave, I think you should just give a few minutes of commentary on what we've just heard. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, there's a lot of, lot of things in there, but, I, you know, and Andrew said it's taken 25 years to reach this clarity of, of it, but this is where, you know, from a, a pepper moth, this is where... You know, I've been 20 years in marketing um, around the world, and I've also, I think, concluding some of the similar things is that when when you finally when you have identified a, 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 a high unmet need or or even a, a modestly unmet need in in a in a in a segment or group of customers that share that need, and you can come up with something that you've clearly you've developed, you know, a, a, you know, a bespoke, uh, innovative. Offering that absolutely nails what these people want to get their jobs done, to keep their brands whole, and keep and get their jobs done more efficiently, better, and feel you know also feel that personal touch uh, along that journey. When when you when you can match, you know you can meet what they, what they want with that sort of proposition. Uh, that's when you can charge the premium and, and, and push that to an appropriate price because it's about value proposition as you said value for money and there are far too many companies who are shy uh, around price often though it's because they're not that differentiated they're a little bit me too the competition and people start doing the same things we only have to look at the supermarkets to see how that goes and the pricing then is not a luxury of pushing it up it ends up getting pushed down but that's clearly not what you've done and I it's a real pleasure actually so it's very unusual for us to come across a company yeah. that absolutely clear about who your customers are, what they want, how you're going to deliver it. You keep innovating to keep better serving them in due course, driving, you know, reinvesting in the company. Uh, not, not uncomfortable around appropriate pricing. And, you know, I, I can, you know as we discussed before the call, you, you've got this sort of life cycle of opportunity to, to take that model beyond the, the legal sector. And um, I could go on for hours about, I know, uh, I know. about this, but it's you know it is a it is a wonderful example of marketing strategy. What what we like to do, which is which is because marketing strategy is difficult. What we like to do with clients is to try and accelerate the twenty five years by getting people to think this through strategically before they go out and spend all their money on expensive tactical things. You know, websites and trade shows and and PR and advertising and, and social media and you name it because they can throw mud at any market and you might get some we've got a big budget but if they did some of the thinking that you've arrived at you know it's taking you time to get there maybe they could get there a bit quicker and that's where we try to help people to think through those big decisions before they start investing absolutely so Andrew what is this strategic marketing question you'd like to ask Dave well uh, what I'd like to ask Dave is that we, we, uh, we provide services to 40 of the top 100 law firms, um, but we, we, we often are uh, providing them in at an operational uh, level to a facilities director or an IT uh, director. Um, and what our realisation is, is that around uh, the boardroom table in the top 100 law firms today, 
that the director of marketing has a very powerful voice mm. because these firms that are going global, uh, that are providing services to huge global corporates are realizing that their brand when they are selling professional services is all they have to sell. The brand yeah. is everything. And so the marketing directors have been bought in now. Uh, the partners have realized that they can't do everything yeah. uh, to really try and, and galvanize these brands and what they mean to, uh, to, to, to their customers. Uh, I uh, have ta tasked my marketing team um, to, put, to create a campaign to get us in front of these marketing directors who are not traditionally our contacts within these organizations so that our brand proposition, our value proposition can be delivered to the right person where it's going to resonate mm -hmm. um, and have a voice at the boardroom table, around the yes. boardroom table. And my question to Dave is, um, if you were sitting in my chair, how would you do that? Yeah, so, and, and we will give this some more thought after this podcast, you know, and, and maybe come back to you on, on a, a broader answer. But my initial reaction to that with the brief thoughts are, you know, as in any marketing planning, is first seek to understand those customers. What do they need? So the marketing, well, first and foremost, actually, I'm, I, I'm delighted to hear that the legal businesses have seen the value of proper strategic marketeers and have started hiring them and, and, and exposing them to the, the board level um, um, discussion and, and influence. Because if, if before I walked in this room, uh, presumptuous as I might be, I would have assumed that they'd been boxed into a communications role in the back office, like many marketeers have in, in organisations who don't get it. So I'm delighted uh, about that because I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm an enthusiastic marketeer and I, and I hate it being devalued by, by people who have a narrow view with a little m. I prefer the big M and understanding what it really means about driving shareholder value, actually, you know, if you really want a short definition. So that's delighted. It, so I would... T I would I would get together with with groups of, of of those individuals that you know well or that you can get introduced to, under the and I say it's not under the guise but under under the the real uh, request of, of market research. Initially, I would form some focus groups, get them around the table, uh, uh, and some one to one discussions. It may be focus group one to one. It may be actually you know questionnaire based. It doesn't whatever methodology it is is to and I would be keen to understand. What are they trying to get done? What jobs are they trying to get done? What are their needs? Are those needs, they'll be emotional needs, they'll have functional needs in order. And some of those things that they'll think that, 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 that are, are, are well served, some of them are underserved, or some of them may not be served at all, right? So they're, and they're always wonderful to find the gems where no one's offering something, but often we, as you said earlier, it may be just that it's underserved and you can do things better for them. And, and once you understand their needs well, uh, you know, not least can you uh, sort of describe your current proposition to them and understand how that matches their needs today. But you could also then put the, 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 the deep learnings about and insights into these customers, into your product innovation path. So when you invest your limited resources into product development, you're doing it with a clear intention of better serving the marketing directors in the law business, and but and clearly you'll come up with something that better nails that the the the, 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 the uh, meets their needs. Um, so that's a sort of a general process thing. But uh, you know the the other aspect of this, just thinking about it from as a marketeer, if I was in their role, irrespective of the type of business, is that they are bound sure if they are disciplined marketeers to be concerned about brand, to 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 be concerned about brand equity. They're bound sure to be concerned about positioning, and I mean in a purest sense of marketing to business positioning. What, where does their firm occupy? Uh, where does it sit in the minds of their target segments, target customers, as a premium law firm in a specialty area, or whatever they do? And 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 positioning, you know, we positioning happens where the firms do nothing. It will happen. You will end up in the perception of of your customers somewhere. But positioning is something you can influence, and you can influence it through 
enlightened strategic actions and they may be that you've defined the right messages, you're delivering them through the right channels. It may be that you over deliver on a promise on every project you do at the right price and you follow up with customers and you make them feel special as a proper customer service and over delivery. It may be, it may be driven by all aspects of, of, of the firm's uh, brand and delivery which will include the, the piece that you currently offer, even if you change nothing, you are contributing to the law firm's uh, ability to achieve the right positioning in, in premium customers' minds. Today, you already are. And maybe that needs to be made clear to the marketeers. And if they're on a journey with you in helping you then uh, innovate and better serve them, uh, and not least understanding how you already serve them, I don't think it would be a particularly long job for you to, 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 to resonate with them. Um, that would be my initial uh, 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 reaction, um, and we should give it some more thought uh, uh, offline. That were, Dave, thanks, th thanks for that, and I will be forwarding the podcast onto my marketing team so they can listen to, <laughs> to your words as well yeah. from the horse's mouth. Excellent. So as we start <coughs> to wrap up this interview, Andrew, I've got a few closing questions for you. The first one is, what is your favourite business book? Um, well, I was silly enough not to read any business books for a long, a long time because I didn't think I would find anything useful in them. But I've, <laughs> I have, um, I have, I have, I um, have seen the error of my ways. A number of great business books. There, uh, one that I'm sure you've heard of before is Good to Great. You know, this is a, a bible of uh, that any entrepreneur should read about differentiation, focus, getting the right people on the bus, getting you know. Uh, understanding what you do it's a fantastic book R really good one that uh, we used in the organization when we're, we're we're just around about the well we're 75 people so we're getting up to that hundred person yeah you know type hurdle that uh, you've got to go over uh, was five dysfunctions of a team I don't know if you've read that no, I no, can't no. tell you who the author is it's easily read in about an hour and a half it's so brilliant um, and if you give it to your team to read everybody will find somebody in there they relate to fantastic um so it's just it's just great and it drives for us it drove around for our management team um some rules um, of engagement and honesty about how we should act as a team together very good, um, very good. i would say that was those two so, so what i'll do is in the show notes I'll the actually reference jim collins jim collins, yeah. Jim collins. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so what i'll do in the show notes i'll reference these books yeah. um, so that people can actually find them if they want to read them so next we'd like to actually say thank you very much and as a gesture of our thanks make a donation to your favorite charity uh well uh charity very close to my heart is the royal windsor rose and horticultural society uh, charity in uh, Windsor uh, that uh, is all about creating a cohesive community around enjoyment of horticulture and food and crafting. It's 120 years old. The Queen is our patron. We have a very small number of, of members, but it's a, a really great small charity. Um, that, and I'm chairman of it, I should Fantastic. say. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we'll make sure we, that happens. And again, I'll put Thank the you. link on the website. For Thank you. you very much indeed. So as we really draw to a close, how can our listeners actually get in contact with you and Comexo? Um, I have a blog under Andrew Try. Uh, if you just Google Andrew Try, uh, T-R-Y, you can find me, or Comexo, C-O-M-X-O. Um, my email address is andrew.try at comexo.com. And the phone number here if they want to call you? 01753 710430. Excellent, excellent. So um, a little bit of a plea now to our listeners. Um, we bring you these podcasts for free. There is no payment at all, as you know. And our currency is a social currency. Um, if you've enjoyed listening to the podcast today, please go to... Um, iTunes and make sure you subscribe and better than that if you could rate us or leave a comment that would be wonderful because it helps spread the word and draw more people into listening to these interviews and allows us to go to potential guests and get them to come in and um, provide great uh, content for you to listen to. So finally Andrew you have been a fantastic guest, it's been a brilliant interview, we're a little bit over time but thank you very much for your time today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank, you. thank you very much.